What do you got for me? Okay, here it is. The Graduate, part two. Oh, good. Now listen, the three principals are still with us. Dustin Hoffman and Ben With a modest budget of $6 million, Chinatown grossed five times that much during its initial domestic release in 1974 and garnered 11 Oscar nominations. Its prestige only kept rising in the following years, and it was soon considered one of the most important crime films of all time. Chinatown. Chinatown. Chinatown is Chinatown. <laughs> Yet today, only the most devoted cinephiles are aware that Nicholson and the rest of the gang returned for a sequel. In fact, there were two planned sequels, but more on that later. As early as two years after the original came out, Variety reported that Chinatown 2 was in the works. It became one of the most coveted projects in Hollywood for well over a decade, and its storied production contained as much drama, mystery and intrigue as the film itself. Minus the incest. The principal players of this tale were three close friends, Robert Town, Robert Evans and Jack Nicholson, and the two Jakes caught the three of them at a crossroads. Robert Town was the screenwriter. His credits included The Last Detail, Shampoo and, of course, Chinatown. For a time he could do everything he wanted in Hollywood, and what he wanted was to direct. In 1982 his desire was met with personal best. Despite the film's merits, its production was anything but smooth, going over schedule and far over budget. But its capital sin was that it made no money. Greystoke, the story of Tarzan's childhood, was set to be his second film, but instead he was removed from the project. Hugh Hudson took his director's chair and his beloved script was mangled. Famously, Town was so angry with the revisions to his work that he gave his script credit to P. H. Vaza, his best friend. To this day, the only Hungarian sheepdog with an Academy Award nomination. But even before getting kicked out of Tarzan, Town had started taking copious notes for the sequel to Chinatown, The Two Jakes, originally titled The Iron Jew, in honor of its main inspiration, producing mogul and player number two, Robert Evans. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Evans, and I'm Senior Vice President of Paramount Pictures. Who is that guy? Bob Evans, head of Paramount. The guy's more connected than God. For a while, Bob Evans couldn't miss. Harold and Maude, Love Story, The Godfather Saga. He was even responsible for bringing Roman Polanski from Poland to direct Rosemary's Baby. Wait, wait, wait Polanski? I think he's perfect for it. I loved Rosemary's Baby. Well, you're welcome. However, by the early 80s, his Midas touch had abandoned him. Haunted by a conviction for cocaine possession and a string of critical and box office failures that included Popeye, he was considered a loser and a liability. Lucky for Evans in town, they had Jack Nicholson in their corner. Fourth quarter, eight minutes to go. Nicholson was a legendary friend, sometimes to his detriment, asked Bob Rafelson or Mike Nichols. In 1970 and 71, he starred in Five Easy Pieces, Rafelson, and Carnal Knowledge, Nichols. When both directors sunk deep into a creative and commercial slump, Nicholson supported them by starring in Rafelson's Man Trouble or Nichols' Heartburn and Wolf. When Nicholson caught wind that the two Bobs were planning a sequel to Chinatown, he was the only actor powerful enough to make it happen. I guess this proves there are as many nuts in the Academy as anywhere else. However, his involvement with the two Jakes wasn't purely selfless. After his 1975 Oscar win for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, his productivity had declined, and the films he chose were largely those that offered him opportunities for flamboyant self-parody, The Shining, and amenable fluff, The Witches of Eastwick. That's an excerpt from Sam Wasson's book, The Big Goodbye. Gone was the impotent outrage he showed in the six years between Easy Rider and Cuckoo's Nest, when at the peak of his creativity, Nicholson had made an astonishing 14 films, most of them astonishing in their own right. The Two Jakes was supposed to be kismet. It would be Robert Down's second shot at the director's chair, Robert Evans' rebirth as a producer, and the return of J.J. Kittas would be Nicholson's resurrection as an actor. Things moved fast and The Two Jakes was set to be Paramount's big flick come Christmas 1986. 
but fast isn't necessarily good. Robert Town was a notoriously slow writer. It took him eight years to write Shampoo, and in the year 2023, he's yet to finish the first draft of Condition. Evans did all in his power to persuade him to write faster, including spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money to throw him a wedding. After the ceremony, quote, Robert didn't quite keep up to his end of the bargain, because the script was 80% complete. Now it's a decade later, it still remains 80% complete. Bob Evans, I'm the best there is, yeah! Evans wasn't only part of the solution. If you remember, the Iron Jew, aka Second Jake, was based on him. Down wanted Evans to play him himself. However, his glory days as an actor happened in the 1950s, and they weren't very glorious to begin with. The Fiend Who Walked the West. It had been 15 years since he last acted in The Best of Everything, and even in his prime, It'd be a tough ask to act against one of the best performers of the 20th century. And to boot, the two Jakes had an all-star cast that included Kelly McGillis, Kathy Moriarty, Joe Pesci, and Dennis Hopper. Sadly, of that group, only Nicholson ended up in the film. When production began, Town saw one screen test and immediately regretted casting Evans. Nicholson tried to convince him to go ahead with the film, quote, Why don't we just go ahead and start the movie, get Paramount on the hook, then decide? Town responded, no, his integrity wouldn't allow him to do it that way. Sets were built, locations were scouted, and principal photography was set to begin. But it didn't. After a series of high-level meetings, Paramount decided to pull the plug on the production after an estimated loss of $3.5 million. The movie went back into the drawer for another three years, and their friendships were never the same. Robert Evans is a unique individual in every way, so... Uh, and somebody that we all got along with, and somebody who understood all of... You know, we were friends, I mean... Robert Town had his wedding at Ed Evans' house. After 1985, our hero's career stooped to new lows. Robert Evans essentially no longer had one, mainly due to the murder investigation of one of the financiers of the Cotton Club, the last film he had managed to produce. Robert Town finally directed his second film, which was a mild success. But notoriously, he was shopping around the two Jakes, getting as far as a few meetings with Dino De Laurentiis, where he pitched Harrison Ford in the role of Jack Nicholson. In the meantime, Jack Nicholson had been toying with the idea of reviving his directing career. He hadn't directed since Going South in 1978, a film that was unequivocally panned. However, his first directing job, Drive, he said, had shown some real promise. Vincent Camby wrote, quote, Drive, he said, was so much better than all of the rest of the campus junk Hollywood had manufactured in the last couple of years. Roger Ebert called the film disorganized but occasionally brilliant. The Two Jakes was Nicholson's last shot at directing. In 1988, it was full steam ahead. Sort of. Evans was back, although by his own admission, he was producer in name only. Town submitted the shooting script, but more than three years later it remained only 80% complete. The shoot was approaching, which left Nicholson, the director, and Town, the writer, with the task of doing extensive revisions. But that was a challenge. Polanski, the director of the original, was a cold and cerebral editor, whereas Nicholson was hardly the guy to rein in Town's more convoluted ideas. His thought process was possibly even more convoluted, and when the two men disagreed, Jack decided that didn't sit well with Town was already soured on the project, which he felt was his to direct. Right before the shoot, he had a meeting with Tom Cruise and company, which led to a job writing Days of Thunder. And by the time filming began, Town was in Bora Bora with his second wife. Quote, Jack was one of the most important people in my life, Town said, looking back. We grew up together. He taught me how to write by watching him act. I swore he would become a movie star and I would write for him, and one day that happened. He was the closest friend I had. By the time the shoot started, they were no longer on speaking terms. During the day, Nicholson acted and directed. At night, instead of sleeping, he continued to work on the script up to the moment they stopped shooting. He was compromised, exhausted, and abandoned. 
When the filming wrapped in late October 1989, it was clear all those things had taken a toll. They had fallen short of the original by a long mile. Continuity was shaky at best, and the storyline needed to be straightened out in the cutting room, which delayed the film's release for almost a full year. Fill-ins had to be shot, and an unplanned voiceover narration was written, a hard-boiled prose that was completely at odds with anything Robert Town had written before or since. You can't forget the past any more than you can change it. Hearing Catherine Mulray's name started me thinking about old secrets, family, property, and a guy doing his partner dirt. Right there. Cut it right there. That's no! 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 After witnessing what had become of his script, Robert Town washed his hands of the film. When the film was released in October 1990, Town was vindicated. The Two Jakes was a disappointment on all fronts. It lacked the tautness and clarity of Chinatown, it was sluggish and overly convoluted, and the voiceover narration did very little to hide the narrative holes of the script. Three full decades later, The Two Jakes is all but forgotten, yet its impact in the history of the silver screen is both undeniable and tragic, with deep repercussions for its main players. Robert Down had planned the final film of the trilogy, Giddes vs. Giddes, that never saw the light of day. Town never achieved success as a director, and he never wrote another masterpiece. Robert Evans died in 2019, a few years after having a minor comeback. Here he is, living it up at an event for How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, his single hit since the disco era. Sadly, he never came close to his former status as a head of a production company. And Nicholson, he was the biggest casualty from the two Jakes. While his acting career certainly never slowed down, the same cannot be said about his directing. In a 2005 interview for Entertainment Weekly, Jack Nicholson told Gregory Kirschling, quote, You know, I was going to be a director. I became a movie star by circumstance, and then de-emphasized my own directing career. I actually thought I'd make one movie as a director for every three I made as an actor, and I've done three. Jack would go on to retire from acting in 2010, 24 years after he vacated the director's chair. One has to wonder what kind of movies he could have made if the two Jacks had been a hit. But it wasn't. When asked why the third film would never get made, Town replied, Well, in the interest of maintaining my friendships with Jack Nicholson and Robert Evans, I'd rather not go into it. But let's just say, the two Jakes wasn't a pleasant experience for any of us. But we're all still friends, and that's what matters most. Recently, some footage surfaced showing John Polito in a screen test in the role of J.J. Gittes. I'm a private snoop like you, man. A dick, man. And let me tell you something. I dig your work. Playing one side against the other in bed with everybody is fabulous stuff. 